Hey guys, if you really like this episode, please support our podcast by going to talkmurder.com slash join and becoming a Talco Supremo. There's an old adage out there that says a brother is a friend given by nature. And just like any other friend, we should forgive them for their wrongdoings. But what happens if that brother and friend does something many would consider unforgivable? What if your brother commits a murder? Could you forgive him? Would you still consider him a friend? And finally, would you agree to testify against your own brother? We sold out our first live show! That's right. We popped the champagne already. First and foremost, I don't think any of us really knew quite what to expect. Um, booking our first live show in, you know, it's technically it's Jen and my original hometowns, but it's no longer our hometown since we live in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, but we had our first, you know, booked our first show, didn't really know how ticket sales were going to go, especially since we knew that we had, you know, some friends and family who could make it, but, you know, didn't know how much of the audience would have to consist of friends and family. And we are blown away that, we sold out the whole show in just 11 days. I mean, really, thank you, Tacos listeners, for supporting us. We yes. cannot wait to see you on August 8th at Shoveltown Brewery. That's right. I am I am pumped. I'm so pumped. I really wish that we had more tickets. We've gotten, you know, even after we sold out the show, a lot of people asking if we'll come back to Massachusetts or if we could get more tickets and you know, we'll we'll keep you posted if anybody cancels, but um, can't thank you enough for all the support. Uh, once we get this first show under our belt, we will be adding some additional tour dates to our one night stand tour, um, which, by the way, we have our official design up and running from one of our tacos, Kendra. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys can buy the shirts right now, too. You can. So go to the website, click on the shop, and uh, buy the tour shirt if you're coming to the venue, because we're all going to be wearing them. Plus, there's a couple other designs that are up there, too. So if you want to represent, just talk murder to me in general, you can get it all there. Mm -hmm. Yes. We got some brand new Taco Supremos to shout out. Sam from Iowa. Hey, Hey, Sam. Sam. Yeah, and I sent her a gif of... Potatoes? Tractors and corn. Because I didn't know what was in Iowa. And that's well, the first thing that so that's up. just like your your assumption. Yeah. She listens to us with earbuds when she's cooking and cleaning because she needs a mental escape from her kid. Oh, that sounds bad. Um, <laughs> she says... Keep it real, girl. I, yeah. She says, uh, I love listening to y'all all. The comedy aspect really helps on stressful and chaotic days, one of my favorite things is when John stumbles over an unfamiliar word. Oh, damn it. I didn't see that. <laughs> and pronounces it every possible way he can think. What else mean? <laughs> no, that's no. funny. That's great. Okay, she, it's yeah, endearing. It's funny. And pronounces it every possible way he can think of because that's the same shit I do. That makes me feel good. There you go. Anyway, thanks for keeping me sane throughout the day. You're so welcome. We keep it real, y'all. And also, we got Rachel from New England. Now, Rachel is a former, she just hit her 20 years, retired from the U.S. Army. Oh, wow. Thank you for your service, Rachel. Thank you so much for your service. And she seems like she's a lot smarter than we are. She is actually in school right now for physical anthropology. Cool. Nice. Yeah, which is something to do with bones. Yeah, I think. No. Yes. She's also got her business degree. She's from Massachusetts. Oh, nice. Where? And she lives in Somerville. (gasps) South Carolina? Yeah, she lives in Somerville. Oh, sweet. She lives right down the road from us. Oh, uh, maybe we've we've crossed paths at work. Maybe we have. I sent out some stickers for you guys. Thank you so much for supporting us. You have no idea how much it means and how far it goes for this podcast. It does. So Jen's back from... Long Island. Long Island. Long Island. She's back from her home in Long Island? No. Nope. Nope. Not where she's no. from. Oh, no? She went to a wedding. Let's review. So last week we only put out the part one, and I know you guys have 
been antsy for part two. I'm so antsy for part two. Pee wee, pee wee playing with your pee pee. But we are holding off a little bit because I have an interview with someone that is extremely close with the case. So we're waiting a little bit to release part two. But to make it up for you guys, we are releasing three episodes this week. We're going to be working hard. We got today's episode is a mm-hmm. taco special. All right. We got an episode that I'm releasing on Thursday, which is a crazy can't make this shit up in the news case. All right. All and right. We have another one we're releasing Saturday for our talk Supremo Kira. All it's right. About, it's about a lobster roll, so look forward to that. Okay. Ooh. I was all I was really thinking, I wonder if there's any place here that sells lobster rolls. McDonald's. No. Well, McDonald's oh, does not God. sell lobster rolls. Um, they Pearls do back does. Home. That's weird. Oh, Pearls. So I do have a story to share about my time in Long Island. Do tell, do tell. So Tara, uh, t- our, our friend Tara was driving uh, driving up to the house that we were staying in. It was an Airbnb. She goes, I do want to tell you, you got to let me know if you feel a presence in the house. Because Jean and I, Jean is her husband, um, and Jean and I think that there's something creepy in here. But it got better. In the Airbnb co- house? In the Airbnb They've house. They've stayed there before? No, they haven't. They were just there previously before they dropped. They you got off. they gotcha. got there on Tuesday. And this is Thursday. Got it. Got it. So I'm like, oh great! This is the first thing you tell me. You know that I don't fuck with ghosts, and the yeah. first thing you're gonna tell me before I even step foot into this house is that oh, there's probably a ghost in here. So I walk in, and it, you know the house is all bright and nice, and I'm like, I don't feel any ghost presence at all. Like I don't, I didn't think it was creepy. Until the next day, we went into the room where Ellabelle was sleeping. Ellabelle is their daughter, and she, um, they had, like, these pictures of these shells, like, probably from Bermuda. I think it said it was from Bermuda, and they went on vacation, and there were just pictures of shells. And they were kind of cool until I realized the one above the bed that, like, it was two day beds, one on each side of the wall. One above the bed um, said, remember me, spelled out. And that was, like, that's kind of weird. And so... Gene hmm. was like, no, it says we remember, which is equally as creepy. But I was like, no, Gene, you're reading it upside down. So I like moved it, not even thinking. I moved the picture and so I could show him that it says remember me, not we remember. And so I put it back. But then later that night, Gene was out um, with his, his groomsmen on the, his bachelor party. And we were about to put Ellie down to, to bed. And she goes, that's angry. And we're like, what? what's angry? She goes, <sighs> The picture is angry. Oh <laughs> my god! What picture? That's the, creepy. The, the picture that says "Remember me." She pointed you to moved it. But here's the thing, though. You didn't see it before. No, we did. But here's the thing: Alabel was asleep when that whole thing happened. Mm. So oh. she's the demon. No, she sensed. Oh. the ghost. Wait, well, so the picture changed his face? No, no. she said okay. that the picture was angry. She said the picture was angry. So. Um, so yeah, so, I'm so confused. needless to say, Tara, Ellabelle, and myself all shared their bed <laughs> yeah. that night, and, but I just didn't feel like it was a creepy house, but that's my story about, I mean, she was, did you feel like it was a creepy house after that? Um, not really, but, oh, I would have, I've I been mean, like, get little, me out. I was a little creeped out by that, but like, I don't know. It just, I just didn't feel the energy. If it was there, I don't think it was mean, but well, that's said, good. But kids are supposed to be more sensitive to that kind of stuff than adults are, you know. The fact that she was yeah. literally passed out when that whole conversation happened was kind of crazy. And we're like, she, we're like, show us which one. It's, and she pointed to that one. And mm-hmm. we're like, which one? She like went up to it and pointed to it. So Wow. That's yeah. weird. That's creepy. But other than that, it was a fun time, huh? It was a great time. The wedding was beautiful. Congrats, Tara and Jean. I'm so happy for you. And thank you so much for making me part of your special day. Um, I can't wait for all those fun photos to, to to come out. I hope there's one halfway decent of me. All right. So tonight we are doing a special episode request for our Talkos Primo and good friend Chuck. Oh, Chuck. Chuck, Chuck is for, also from New England, isn't mm-hmm. he? He's from New Hampshire. So New Hampshire. a little thing about Chuck is he used to work for BJ's. Really? He was Nuh-uh. the marketing director. Yeah. No. That's so funny. Yeah, he was. He didn't tell me that. Well, you That's didn't so ask cool. him. Small world. Which, uh, which region? 
That's so funny. Oh, I don't know. I don't well, work there. He was in New Hampshire, so. You know what? We probably have mutual friends. That's weird. Not weird. Fun. Fun weird. Weird fun. He actually emailed me and said that he was approached by investigation investigation discovery. Oh wow! Nice. Yeah. That uh, organization. That, that, IDTV. Yeah, IDTV. Because he has a story that's in his family. So his brother <laughs> is serving life in prison right now for a murder. Oh wow! And they approached him, and he turned it down, and he decided to email me privately and ask if I could tell a story. Wow. This is after he heard the Vegas episode. Wow. So that's amazing. Chuck, thank you. Thank you you so much. I'm very honored. And I, I prepared a lot for this story. And so this is for you. Now his name is Chuck Piawick or Piawick. In fact, when I interviewed him over the phone, I wanted to make sure how to say the name because I'm so shitty at it. So here it is. So your last name is pr- pronounced Piawick, right? I want to. No, no, it's Piawick. 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 Okay. Piawick. Yeah, I'm gonna listen to myself say that like thirty times, so I don't <laughs> mess that up. Piawick. So if I say say it wrong, then I'm just an idiot. As soon as I talk to Chuck on the phone, there's two things I noticed about him as a person. Okay, number one, he's extremely intelligent which is why a lot during the conversation, I wouldn't even say anything because you could tell he's really smart, you know, which means his brother's also really smart and he'll talk about that. The other thing that I noticed right off the bat, which was good, was how compassionate Chuck is. Mm. I feel like if we ever end up in his neck of the woods and we get slosh drunk at four in the morning, we could call him, and he'd give us a place to stay. Mm. He would probably give the shirt off his back for Well, anyone. Chuck will keep you posted when <laughs> yes. we come to a touring city near you. <laughs> I mean, he is just probably the nicest, most compassionate guy I've talked to on the phone. Like, just a s- straight-up guy. And I've, guys, like, when I was in the military, like, that was my job, is to read people. You guys yeah. know I can read oh, people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I read people all the time. That was what I do. So that's the two things that I notice about Chuck, you know. He's very smart, and he's a straight-up guy. Chuck, that's a pretty big compliment, I gotta <laughs> yeah. say. He's a tough judge, a yes. character. <laughs> yeah. And if he compliments you, then that's, like, the highest compliment you can get. Yeah. He doesn't just dole out compliments. You have to earn them. Exactly. Just know, since we get none of them. Mm-hmm. That's not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> All right, so we're going tonight to the lovely city. What city is that? Um, or what state is that? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. We're going to New Hampshire tonight, the Portsmouth area. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was going to say it looks like Portsmouth. Seems like a beautiful place up there. It is. It's too far north for me, but tonight we're going to be talking about an older case from 1996 of the murder of Carol Caswell. Now, she hmm. is from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where we're going tonight, and she actually disappeared August 23rd, 1996. Okay. Now, I'm just going to break it down for you right here. Chuck's brother is currently serving life in prison for this murder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just to get you guys on the same page. So basically, I interviewed Chuck about everything I could think of. And a lot of this information is not publicly available. Hmm. And that's not because it's hidden. It's because this was in 1996 and no one knew how to use the internet back then. True. True. In fact, I think the internet was created in 96. Was it 96 or 98? I think it was 96. Because Windows, I remember having a Windows 98 computer. So, oh, yes, that's right. Out. Yeah, I think it was 96. I mean, maybe it was earlier than 96. So I'm just no, saying. I, think it was I do 96. remember having a 96. I think it was Windows 95 98. when they created it, but 96 is when it, because I know Amazon was registered in 1996. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. And that's all that matters in this world. Well, then the internet would have had to have been created before then. No, 1996. All right. So we're talking about Carol Caswell tonight. She disappeared from the Starlight Club, which is now gone. Now, this mm-hmm. is a new... Have you guys been in New Hampshire? Yes. I have Many not times. been. Yes. You've been to the Portsmouth area? Yes. All right. Tell, tell us about it. I don't really remember the Portsmouth area, but like I have been there when I was a kid because we had my cottage which in Raymond, which is not too far from Portsmouth. She was last seen at the Starlight Club. 
Okay, mm-hmm. Starlight Lounge is what it was called. That club is no longer there. Mm-hmm. All right, it's been replaced. And in fact, I found and I couldn't find a picture of it. I really wanted to see a historic picture of it. Couldn't find it. But from SeacoastOnline.com, which we're going to be reading a lot of articles from, from November. 24, 2002, says that the police chief at the time would respond to frequent calls there. Quote, we go there more than the majority of other establishments. We get calls for intoxication and fights. So it's kind of a rowdy club, but it is a members only club. Oh, really? Like BJ's. Yeah. So it is a members only club. And to bring a guest, you have to assign... Like if someone comes with you, they have to sign in as well. Every I'm time you- surprised at a place that rowdy would be a members only type place. Well, maybe that allowed them to be a little bit more rowdy. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I thought it was a strip club. I'm not gonna lie. It sounds like a strip club. The Starlight Lounge it sounds like a total. Strip Isn't club. there something the Starlight something downtown Charleston too? No, that's crazy. There's horse. stars. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. It's a great restaurant. The Crazy Horse is a strip club in Charleston. I wasn't talking about oh. strip club. I was talking about the dark. Well, good to know that you're very well familiar with that establishment. Maybe that's where the gyros truck is, but you wouldn't care because you don't like gyros. You mean oh gyros? God. I love gyros. Gyros. No, we're from America. We say gyros. No, there's a song by there's a song that Luke um, Luke Bryan. There's not even a U in it. Gyros is what it's pronounced. The UK gyros. spins gyros. Gyros. So anyway, I thought this place was a strip club. So, of course, I asked Chuck, and here's what he said. The night that she disappeared, they were at a club in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Okay. And it was... The Starlight Club, right? I think think it was Starlight. Yeah. Yep. And it was a members-only club. So when you went into the club, you had to sign in. Was that that a strip club? I couldn't find anything about it. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. The name sounds like it, but I don't think it was. So it's definitely not a strip club. The cops actually, eventually, they look at the guest list, and they see Carol Caswell, and then below that, they see two names. One, Mickey Thompson. The other, Ed Piawick. When the police got that information, they had, they had, because remember that Starlight Club was a members-only club? Yeah. So Carol Caswell signed into that club that night, and the yeah. next person to sign in was my brother. Yeah. And the next person after him was Mickey. Hmm. So that's how that's how the ball started rolling in that direction. Carol Caswell's at the club. These two other guys show up, meet her, and then she disappears. All right. Now, but you don't know that they necessarily met right off the bat. They just signed in after her. Exactly. Or, they, or, they, or now, did she? I don't know if they knew each other prior or not. Okay. okay. But, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say this so it flows with the story. She actually wasn't found. Her body, her body wasn't actually found for another two years. Oh, wow. And not even in New Hampshire. Her body was found in Lincoln, Maine, Ooh. which is about 200 miles north yeah. of, New Ham- of where this happened because in New Hampshire. Because Portsmouth is southern New Hampshire. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm showing you right now is the Willen Pond. Okay, now Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you the story about what happened that night because she was killed that night. All right. Okay. That night she died in 1996, August 23rd. They were drinking at Starlight Club. They ended up at this pond, the Willen Pond, and she died at this pond. Now she was with two guys Mm -hmm. and the whole time they were drinking. They were doing drugs, including cocaine, probably some even harder stuff than that. They leave the Starlight Club. They drive to this pond. Now, this is in the same town as where they grew up. Chuck knows this pond. In fact, one of the reasons he doesn't live in New Hampshire anymore is because when he was going to work, he had to drive by this pond every mm. day. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's This hard. is like a childhood pond. Like, he... he you, they would go there the all the time and all that stuff. You know, all the kids of high school would go there all the time. Before I even interviewed Chuck, it was driving me crazy because the newspapers was like, she drowned. Ed Piawick drowned her. And I'm like, drowned her? You know, it's so mm. weird. So, you know what I'm saying? There's got to be something more to this story. And you said this, took, this was in August? Yeah, what, what, this was August 23rd. Yeah. This was August 23rd, 1996. 
so this never really made sense to me. But I asked Chuck, you know, t- tell me about what happened that night. Like, what exactly happened? They drive up probably about 15 minutes from Starlight Lounge to this pond. What, did they get in an argument? Did they get in a fight? And this is what he said. That night, I don't know how they, I don't know how he hooked up with Mickey Tompkins. I don't know how he hooked up with Carol Caswell that night. I don't know the details of that. I do know that they were both at Starlight and they left there. All three of them left there together. Uh-huh. Um, and they drove probably, it was probably about 15 miles. They drove to this little pond that was in the town that we grew up in. Oh, that's it. (laughs) 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 All right. So they drive to this pond, but he didn't explain anything. I think that's on the next slide. (laughs) Sorry. I'm still getting used to this PowerPoint thing. No, I like the PowerPoint. Yeah, me too. All right. So what Chuck told me is either on the way to the pond after the club or at the pond, he doesn't really know. But one of those, Carol Caswell was raped by By one or both men. Ah, we don't know know who. We don't know. We don't know who. Okay. Most likely Ed Piawick, his brother. And apparently either on the way to the pond or at the pond, don't remember exactly, but Carol Caswell was raped. She was sexually oh, assaulted. Okay. You see, that that was not in any of the sources I found. Huh. Yeah. So did anyone, no one pled or no one was charged with that crime? The rape? Correct. I mean, she died right after this. I know, but oh. someone can still be charged with you rape and murder. You can add it onto oh. your sentencing. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't think so, no. Well, he was charged with murder. And, I mean, he's in life in prison without parole. I don't no, know the know. answer to that question. That's I, a good question. Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah. It, might, it would probably say it on the in his um, sentence. Yeah. Like, if he was charged for that, too. Or if the other guy was charged for that. Right. Yeah. That's a good question. All right, so I'm going to get into the background of both of the men, the two guys that were there that mm-hmm. night pretty soon. But for now, I just want you guys to know, both of them were very heavy drug users. Okay? And they both have a lengthy rap sheet. I love saying that lengthy (laughs) rap sheet. Plus they've been in and out of prison. Mm. All right. So they're driving, they're on Coke. They're doing, they're drinking alcohol. They just rape this woman. She's going to go tell. Or, you know, she's going to go to the police. Press charges. Press charges. They're going to back in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, they, but, but then again, they, there's probably an aspect of paranoia too. I mean, you're doing cocaine. You, you know what I'm True. saying? You get paranoid with stuff like this. Plus, they don't want to go back to prison. So now they have a problem. What to do with her so she doesn't go and tell the authorities? So she was sexually assaulted, and apparently at some point, Mickey said to my brother something along the lines of, dude, you're going to go back to jail. Something, something along those lines. And he said, well, only if she lives. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Only if she lives. Well, it kind of reminds me of the uh, part it's one. Ominous, yeah. yeah, ominous. Ominous. Uh, reminds you. Oh, what did I say, ominous? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were saying, I thought you said I'm kind of hungry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, definitely that too. <laughs> um, it kind of, No, but it kind of reminds me of uh, the whole thing from Pee Wee Gaskins, that, that which came from the mob, like, People don't get caught unless bodies are found or whatever. Oh, yeah. Killers don't get caught if bodies don't get found. Yeah. I got that so tattooed on me when you were okay. on vacation. So, uh, yeah. But it kind of reminds me of, like, you don't, you know, you don't want any, or or it also, boys on the tracks, you don't want any witnesses. Yeah, Bill Clinton. Bill. And then I heard Bill Clinton and Hillary said, well, we can't leave any witnesses, Billy. If you haven't heard that one, go back and listen to yeah, that. Yeah, that was fucking great. crazy story. <laughs> All right. So here's what basically happens. I'm going to let Chuck tell it because he could tell it a lot better than me. They basically give Carol Caswell an ultimatum to live or die. Like a game. Well, that's, I mean, who? Like that movie, The Saw. Not but also, really. like, obvi- that's a lose lose situation. Yeah, it turns out to be a lose lose. They're never going to let somebody go. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely a lose lose. But here's what happened. And so apparently, my brother told her that if she swam across the pond. Mm. That she could live. Mm. Now, keep in mind that they're doing drugs the entire time, so I'm sure all three of them were high. 
Yeah. So apparently he said if you if you swim across. So I guess from what I remember, she started swimming across. Actually, I'm sorry. When she started swimming across, that was when Mickey Tompkins said, so she's going to make it and she's going to tell on you, you're going to go to jail. So then my brother convinced her to come back. And then he kills her. We don't know that yet. Well, I mean, yeah, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> well, well, I mean, like, we didn't, we're not sure if it's him or Mickey quite yet. Well, yeah. But one of the things I put in my notes, if, if you get to the point you're swimming across the lake, the pond, you need to just keep on going yeah. and then run the fuck away. I was going to ask, like... I mean, she, she probably didn't know she was going to die that night. Well, you know. you know, we talked a lot when we, you know, you said one of the reasons why Chuck requested this is because we did another very amazing story for another Taco Supremo about her experience as a survivor of the Vegas shooting. And we talked a lot, like you gave a lot of, of kind of guidance and advice about what you should do in that scenario. And this is one where we're kind of getting another inside perspective. I mean, we think about it a lot too, but like yeah. in that situation to, to, if you're on some sort of drugs, like you're probably not thinking clearly. Yeah. But I, oh, think, I, don't. I think you have to, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but in our perspective, listening back to it, we're thinking like, well, there's no way he's going to let somebody live. But not only that, I feel like if you're under the influence, your fight or flight responses are altered. Mm, good point. You know, whether that, depending on the, the drug, if you're, if you're taking a stimulant, they might be heightened or, or, you know, or, you know, I'm not exactly 100% yeah. sure, but you're not. You're not sober, so your responses are are going to either be delayed or or affected in a way that we wouldn't normally respond in a situation. I mean, I don't know. It looks it looks like the, the woods back there. It's like pretty dense, so she might be thinking, "Well, shit, if I keep running." But she doesn't probably know she's going to die. I I know I said, "Yeah, there's what you should do," but honestly, she is friends with these guys most likely. Well, friends, 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 friends with them, from the night for the I, evening. I mean, obviously, this is a very, very sad but story. Then, then again, he says, if you swim across, I'll let you live. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so. if, if you swim across, I'll let you live. So you start to swim across. And then I don't. I, what happened to make her change her mind? Well, he said, just come back. He was probably like, come back. I'm just kidding or whatever. I mean, I would probably th- do the same if, if I was like, okay, if I swim back. I won't tell the police on them. I won't. I'll let them get away with it, and I get to live. I mean, I could totally see that logic, too. Well, it depends on how far across the pond I was. She, I think she made it all the way across, right? She made it pretty far. Oh. There's probably piranha in that fucking pond, too. In New no. Hampshire? Oh, that's not a New Hampshire thing. Maybe some sunfish. Sunfish. Probably some sunfish in that fucking pond. What's sunfish? They have, like, the spiky fins. All righty, then. Perch, bass. So here's what happens. She swims back, and now they have this exact same problem that they had before. He was never going to let her live. He honestly thought she would swim halfway out and then drown. They'd be scot-free. But that's not what happened. But this is what happened. When she came back to them, he stood on her until she drowned. Oh. Spit on her until stood. she— Stood. Oh. Stood on her. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So she comes back, she's probably crawling, probably, yeah, yeah, like crawling, like hands and knees trying to get out of the muddy pond, and he probably just comes up right there, from what I can tell, and just puts his shoe right on her back and kind of puts the weight down on her back and just drowns her right there. And it's probably shallow water. Right. You know, she drowned. I mean, Mm. you can drown in shallow water. Babies drown in shallow water. You don't have to be in, you don't have to be underwater to drown. You just need to have water in your lungs. So that's Hmm. what the whole drowning thing is. If you see in the newspaper, if you, if you research this story, that's what they're talking about where he actually drowned her. Now, I do want to say no one really knows if Mickey was directly involved in killing her. Like we can't say that Mickey went up there and put his foot on there too. So only one person was charged with the crime. From what he says, it was only Ed that killed her. We can say that Mickey helped dispose the body and helped wow. put the body in the trunk of the Chevy Nova they were driving, drive 200 miles to Lincoln, Maine. Now, why would they go to Lincoln, Maine? It's so, so weird. Well, because Mickey Thompson's 
mom lives in Lincoln, Maine. So they actually stopped at his mom's house, which is fucked up. With the body, with the in, body the in the trunk. With the body in the trunk, yeah. Oh, no. With the body in the trunk. They stopped at his mom's house to get a shovel, mm. and then they go and bury Carol Caswell in Lincoln, Maine. It was kind of smart to drive her out of state because... Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction problems. I mean, you know, jurisdictions don't like to work with each other. It's like common knowledge. Police forces don't like to do that. But also, uh, on on the other hand, you don't you don't want to leave a trail. Like you don't want to go anywhere that you have a connection to. Yeah, I know. It's like you'd think that they would just dump it in the middle of nowhere, but they actually have a reason to be there. Yeah, they both put her in the trunk of the car. And then they drove up to Lincoln, Maine, which is where Mickey Tompkins was from. Mm -hmm. And uh, allegedly they got, they stopped at Mickey Tompkins' parents' house and they got a, they got a shovel. And then they, they went to kind of an obscure spot in Maine, in Lincoln, Maine, and they buried her there. Mm. So the reason why they went there is because that's where the other guy was from and he was familiar with the area and apparently it was his idea of where um, where to put her. So did they bury her like in the middle of the woods somewhere in Lincoln or? I couldn't find out where exactly they buried mm-hmm. her. I guess a spot that he knew that was kind of off the beaten path. The police didn't find the body, and a fisherman didn't find the body, like always, or a hunter. You know how <laughs> yeah. it always happens. Yeah. That didn't happen. In well, how'd fact, they find her? Mickey, and I'm, I'm going to get into this, but he actually led police to the body. All right. Really? Yeah, and I'm going to get into that in a second. Oh, was that part of a plea? Maybe. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. the plot thickens. We're catching on. All righty then. Right, we've done this one or two times before. Okay, that's pretty much that murder in a nutshell. Now, let's... Let's talk a little bit about these guys. Okay, you got Ed Piawick and Mickey Tompkins. If I say Thompson, did I say Thompson before? Um, I don't think so. Maybe the oh. first time. I can't remember. Tompkins. Mickey Thompson. Tompkins. His actual name is Merrill, but he just goes by Mickey. I don't blame him for wanting to change yeah. that. No, no offense to anyone else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it reminds me of Meryl Streep, so that's yeah. like the first association you don't think of a um, necessarily. A I also name think right of Merrill Lynch. Yeah. From what I read in the newspaper, both Ed and Mickey Tompkins met at a hotel. It wasn't like a Hilton estate or something. This was like a drug hotel. Like we have these here. There's some in Columbia, I know for sure. They're like little shitty club or like little, little shitty motels. hotels, like motel. Like the Days Inn. Motel. Motel. <laughs> like a little sun, sunset lounge or some shit. I don't know. But it's like a drug hotel. Everyone knows druggies go there. They oh, there is drugs. one that I remember driving by in, in New Hampshire that had, remember we were talking about this one time, the par- color TV that the words are in color and it yeah. was like yeah, it was the vibrating bed. Yeah, this this hotel definitely had a vibrating bed. I would like to try one if it wasn't going to be, like, in such a skeezy place. But I don't think they put those in any sort of classy establishment. Why don't you, like, try to buy one and then return it and say, this wasn't vibrating enough. I remember my <laughs> uncle bought a waterbed. And that shit that leaked. I always wanted thing. a waterbed. That shit leaked so much. I, I would sit on the damn thing. It was like I was in the ocean. It was awful. It made I remember, me sick. Um, you know, uh, Lisa and uh, Lisa, who introduced us, she... They had a water bed in the 90s. I remember whenever we'd go over to the house, we would, like, jump on the bed, but we'd get in trouble in Kendra's, case it popped. Kendra's parents had a water bed. I'll never forget that. And I always wanted to, like, lay on it. I thought it was the coolest thing. But I feel like that really would not be comfortable. Like, sleeping? That's kind of bad not for your back. It's right? awful. I always wanted one. Never got one. You know what, Jen? Maybe your wildest dreams can come true. I don't think I want one now. Yeah. Maybe I'll get a puffy mattress. Puffy, you go. Brought to you puffy, by puffy mattresses, the best mattresses ever. Please buy one using our special link. I do think that they were staying at the same hotel, which the hotel was like this rundown hotel from like the early 1900s in like Whoa. this small little dead town that we grew up in. It was like, it was just like a, you know, everybody knew who stayed at that hotel. It was, mm-hmm. you know, it was, the, it was the people who had problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So like, it, it, apparently they met there. Yeah. Because, yeah, we have those hotels here. There's just, you know, I mean, you could tell uh, the drug, you know, people that do drugs stay at those hotels. Yeah. You know, yeah. like the in town suites mm. I lived at for two weeks. I lived at one of those extended stays for like six months before. Yeah, but mine was in North Charleston and like it was really sketchy. I don't think Ed really knew Mickey that long because I saw somewhere where they were staying at the same hotel, but it, it seems like they kind of just met each other or something, you mm. know? Yeah. Fast friends. I mean, there was always people in and out of his life in that kind of drug and that addiction yeah. lifestyle. You know, there was always new people around and... You know, and we didn't see we didn't see Ed much when he was on his, you know, when he was when he was not clean. Yeah. Um. You know, he kind of stayed away from us because we tried to hold him accountable. So he tried to stay away from us as much as possible. Yeah. Mm, that's hard. Yeah, I wouldn't know anything about that. Um, Me either. So I really can't like take a stance on that. I know it's got to be tough if you got one family member. That's, I mean, because that that would ruin a family, you know. It could. It's a lot, you know, just a lot of money in rehab and trying to get people on a better path. I mean, it's a, it's a total emotional drain as well as could be financially, too. Now, is Ed the older brother? Not the oldest brother, but he's in the middle. Now, I do want to say Chuck is the youngest brother. Okay. Now, Ed and Chuck are eight years apart because I actually asked him— you know, about their life growing up. And, and that's when he told me he was eight years apart. In fact, all of his brothers are eight years older than Chuck. Chuck okay. is Youngest. the baby, pretty much, mm-hmm. you know. All boys? All boys, yes. Yeah, six boys. Wow. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, so I got I got one brother. So the chances of him being a fuck-up or me being a fuck-up is 50-50. Well, not 50-50. But it's, it's very small. But if you have six, the statistics are not on your side of one of those six being kind of a screw up. Hmm. I've never really thought about it like that. You know that. what I'm saying? A lot of it goes into the interpersonal relationships of the family, too. Hmm. Mickey Tompkins actually did take a plea deal. Now, here's kind of what happened. The cops approached Mickey and because they knew he was involved because they went back to Carol Caswell's last known location at that bar, the Starlight Club. They saw who signed in after. They went to Mickey and they made him a plea bargain deal. They said, show us where the body is and you'll get a a lighter sentence. Okay? He actually only got seven months. Seven months? Seven months. And this is for, even though if he didn't... He may have had a direct hand in her. Well, he actually claims that he didn't have anything to do with it. Now, I don't know that for a fact. There's only two people that are living today that know that, and that's him and Ed. Ed says he had, he was just as a part of it as he was. But Mickey claims that, no, this was all Ed. He drowned her. He killed her. But what we do know is they both drove the body up. So seven months of transporting a corpse. I mean, you got all kinds of charges, like mishandling a corpse, and to get seven months is kind of light. Yeah, because you know. don't... Yeah, is that mishandling a corpse, like, if, is that around the same um, type of crime as not reporting a death, too? Because you, like, if someone dies, you have to report that death to someone. I don't know. Mickey didn't just approach the cops and say, hey, yeah, I got this body I want to tell you about. Let me get a plea deal. Were they cl- hot on trail? No, they were not hot on trail. It huh. was two years, and they haven't found anything. Wow. But the ball actually started rolling when police arrested Ed for uh, a domestic violence issue. So he was dating this girl named Patricia. Now, according to Chuck, Patricia mm-hmm. was a very good lady. You know, I didn't really dive into her background. Mm-hmm. But they were dating, and he started beating on her. And mm-hmm. during one of the assaults, he basically says, I'll do to you what I did to Carol Caswell. Oh. Yeah. Which reminds me of the Bo Dukes and Ryan yeah. Ducks. And it yeah. Ryan Dukes. reminds me kind of of Clur. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Claire was also one of my favorite episodes that we've yeah, done. Yeah, I agree. So Mickey at the time was actually in jail for some unrelated charge. 
mm-hmm. when they when they quote unquote found him. But he doesn't he wasn't involved in why this unsolved case for a couple of years actually started spinning in motion. My brother, two years later, went on another bender. Yeah. And he, when he got out of rehab that time, he was in a relationship with a fantastic woman. Patricia? Dern? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he was in a relationship with her, and then he started drinking, which that mm-hmm. was always the beginning of his issue. Like, he would just have... He would start with a beer with dinner, and then it turned into a six-pack with dinner, yeah. and then it mm-hmm. turned into a 12-pack and a line of Coke with dinner. Like, mm, yeah. it, just, it, it would progress pretty quickly every time he started drinking. Um, and so he attacked and sexually assaulted her as well. Mm. Yeah. And during the attack, she said to him, I can't believe you're doing this. You're going to go back to jail. Like, that's so dumb. What are you doing? And he said, I'm not going back to jail. I'll just do to you what I did to Carol Caswell. Yeah. Oh. And she was from the same town as Carol. Mm. So, so she knew her. She recognized the name, uh. even though it was a two-year-old kind of a, you know, a cold case. She recognized the name. So she went through. So my brother got the, his neighbor actually came home and heard Patricia screaming. They called the police. My brother was arrested. If I remember correctly, John, I believe he pled guilty to that charge. I don't think he, Mm. I don't think there was a trial for that. Okay. I believe he pled guilty to that charge. And then through all the interviews and everything that, all the times that Patricia had talked to the police, she never mentioned what he had said because she thought he was just being crazy. Like, you know, he thought, she thought he was just trying to get a reaction from her or whatever. Yeah, and several That's months later, after re- after her case was settled and mm. he was sentenced, she went back to the police and she said, "So I just have this thing I have to tell you. It's it's eating away at me and and it's bothering me. And I don't think wow. he meant it, but um, this is what he said." Well, a true example of you see something, say something. Or... Yeah, yeah. So it really reminds me of the uh, Bo Dukes and Ryan Dukes are. Maybe it's the other way around. Ducks, Dukes and Duck. Dukes Dukes and Duke. Duke and Dukes. Bo and Ryan Dukes and the Tara Grinstead episode. And that's episode 48 if you guys want to go listen to it. So basically, the girlfriend, that same scenario played out and the girlfriend actually went to the police in that scenario as well. And Mm -hmm. that's what got him busted. Now, Ed also confessed to others that he killed Carol Caswell. This is from Seacoast Online, posted September 24th, 1999, if you want to read this, Nicole. I think I may have killed some someone, Piawak told me, said the man. He said he wasn't sure. It may have just been a fucked up coke dream. The conversation allegedly took place when both men were serving a 30-day court-ordered term at the Farm Rehabilitation Center in Manchester. The man said that he thought he first thought Piawak was talking about a bar fight or a drunk driving accident. Piawak elaborated. He told the man that he and another man had picked up a woman in Portsmouth. He said they drove out towards some water, a pond, or a lake. The man wasn't sure. Piawak said that there was a sexual assault on the way. Ed was afraid of going back to jail, so he told the other man they couldn't let the woman live, said the inmate. Ed took her down to the water and told her that if she could swim across the water, they would let her live. Either she started and couldn't make it or didn't go. So Ed said he stood on her until she stopped moving. Mm. He said it was some crackhead with a seven-year-old daughter, said the inmate. He said she was more insignificant than someone else. That's so, ugh, that's so disgusting to say that about someone. A few days later, the inmate said Ed told him if he said anything about the murder that Ed would kill his children. The man said he loved his children and was very nervous about testifying. He never went to the police. They found him after Piawak's former girlfriend gave his name to the police. All right. Thank you. Oh, God. So this is now when the police approach Mickey and they offer him a plea bargain, which he leads the investigators right to the body in Lincoln, Maine. The police actually approach the family, the Piawak family. Remember, he's got six brothers. There's six of these brothers. Or excuse me. Chuck's got five brothers. So there's six brothers total. It's a big family. 
Yeah. The father has already passed away. The mother has to take, bear all of this herself. You know, she has to mm. take all this weight on herself. You know, it's really sad. They approach the mother, too, and put pressure on her to testify against her own son. All right. Because they think the mother actually knows more because it's her son. He's probably said it to her in passing or whatever. They're really trying to get the family to come and testify against them. They actually get two of the brothers and they convince them to wear wires and go in and talk oh, wow. to Ed. So they're trying to get a confession. Yeah. These are my confessions. But they're trying to get it like surreptitiously. Boom, that's a badass word. It is. That's a good word. And that is a good word for this, surreptitiously. That means to do things, you know, under the radar. That's a great word. It is. I wonder if that's like it has the same base as serpent. Hmm. Mm, Interesting. Maybe. Never thought about or that. Syrup. It's a great point. Syrup is like, you know, molasses. Yeah. It, it runs slow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the great mo- molasses tragedy that happened in Boston. The molasses. You don't know about the molasses plant that, like, the whole molasses made Boston sticky? Oh, that's what made it sticky. Not all the semen. There's like a, a naval a base city. up there. Yeah. Yeah. In Newport. <laughs> it's a naval base up there. Oh. <laughs> bum bum. Naval base is actually <laughs> Naval base is actually in Newport, Rhode Island, but nice try. You know when they transport whales, you know big whales, like blue bluetooth yeah. whales. Bluetooth Not whales. Bluetooth whales. <laughs> I saw a video, it was like in China or India or one of those countries. They had a big truck, like a semi-truck, and they were transporting this big-ass whale, like a whale in the sea. And it was dead, obviously. But the thing about whales, just like humans, is when you die, you start to bloat. So the video, and I'll even post this on the forum. You bloat when you die? Yeah, you didn't know that? No. No. You never seen anyone die before? No. No. (laughs) But, but you I don't want to use that excuse to be like, wow, she's really bloated. I'll just be like, I'm just dead. I'm just dead. You know, you don't just instantly just blow up. Bloat. It, basically, you're, all the gases in your body try to escape, and it makes you all bloated. You didn't know that? No. Nope. Oh, my God. Bloat. B-L-O-T. B-L-O-T? B-L-O-A-T? B-L-O-T. O-A-T. Blot. So anyway, that's like bacon, lettuce, other things, and tomato. They were they were transporting this big ass whale, and it started to bloat. And all of a sudden, on the video, it just blows up the the whale whale and like whale intestines and whale parts and all kinds of whale parts were all over the street. Oh, it was crazy. I mean, like it shot up like. You know, seven stories. You guys don't care. All right, so the brothers are wearing wires now, and they're going to talk to Ed. But here's the thing about Ed. Which Wait, was Chuck one of the people wearing a wire? I missed this. No, he, well, we'll get to that because they did approach Chuck. But like I said, when I was talking to Chuck, I was like, I mean, he's intelligent. You can tell. So when Chuck said his brother was borderline, you know, between genius and insanity, oh. he said that was his brother. And I could definitely oh, see it. Oh, wow. So this is what he said. To my brother, Ed, you, you know, you've heard the expression, there's a fine line between genius and crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So he walked the line. So he was brilliant. He mm-hmm. could convince you of literally anything. Mm-hmm. And so he could see through you. Like he was, he was really, he was a really good, like reader of personalities. And so when my two older brothers went in, like he instantly knew, like these two guys wouldn't come visit me. First of all, we don't even like each other. Yeah. <laughs> like, why are these guys here? Yeah. So he figured it out pretty quick, and he actually played them. Like, he he was, like, saying, like, crazy stuff on – because he knew they were wearing wires. Like, he was saying this crazy stuff so the cops would hear him. Yeah. Um, and, and probably – I think it was only about 30 minutes in. He was like, you two can leave. Like, take your wire off. Go back to the cops. Like, I'm not talking to either one of you. Put yourself in the shoes for a second. If you have a brother, even if he's the nicest guy in the world, or sister, would you, if the cops came to you and was like, listen, I need you to wear a wire to go in. I mean, think about your sister, Nicole. Like, let's say she's in prison for something. And the cops are like, I need you to wear a wire because it's the only way we can get her to talk. 
I'd Would be, you do it? I'd be pretty torn because it's someone's life at hand, but at the same time, I would be too afraid to put my own life at risk to get a confession. Why would you use your like, sister? What do you mean your own life at risk? Well, it sounds like I would be, so this type of person, right, who's genius borderline. No, I'm talking about your sister. I'm putting it all into context oh. here. So if I was asked to wear a wire because my sister killed someone and they and they needed a confession i mean it would be hard like i'm but you have to it's all all of those things combined drugs criminal record i would think well i guess murder is probably not totally out of the question well he's in prison at the time right but i would yeah. still i would still be fearful if for whatever reason he got out of my own life or she got out from my own life you'd be afraid of your own sister if I was caught wearing a wire to try to turn in. Yeah. Oh, damn. I think. But think about it. Like, if I'm someone, not hanging if, out with your sister anytime soon. No, just think mm-hmm. about, like, the full, Japan, so. the full context of if you're asked. It doesn't have to be a sibling. But if you're asked to wear a wire so that, they, so that you can get a confession out of them. And for whatever reason, they somehow get out of prison someday. You don't think that they would come Dude, after you? Can't you can't kill your own family. You, you watch the whole Sopranos. You you, that's, you can't kill your yeah, own blood. Yeah, but if your family is a, a con, in and out of jail, addicted to drugs, p- possibly killed somebody, I could understand that there would be a conflict there. I'm not saying like I would or wouldn't do it, but I would say that there would definitely be an internal struggle. Yeah, I think for me it would depend on what the crime is. If they needed me to wear a wire for like a lesser crime, I don't know if I... I don't know if I would, but because the stakes are so high, yeah, it's um, murder. I think I, I think I would. I don't know if I'd be able to pull it off. I'd probably get caught, but you know, I, I would, I would try. If it was something like drug smuggling or yeah, something like that, no. I'd be like, pick, you know, police figure it out yourself. But it's somebody else's life at mm-hmm. this point too. Yeah, because at the end of the day, like that's another, you know, another family's daughter, someone's mother, you mm-hmm. know, someone's sister. And you want to help that family get closure any way you can, because a lot of times, you know, the perpetrators, you know, family, they're people, too. They're victims, too. They just don't get that side of the story shared as often because, you know, it's not like they I mean, unless they were involved in a crime. I'm not saying that this is the case. I'm just talking generally here. They're they're losing they're losing a family member, too. Is it right that they that the family members you put away for life? Yeah, but they still have to. They still have stuff that they ha- they have to grieve that loss as well. Even though the person's still alive, it's still a loss that you have to grieve. So I would try to help the other family any way I could. All right. So the police are now putting pressure even on the mother, and Chuck has a problem with that. Obviously, I would too. Like that. I mean, the mother too much is stress dealing yeah. with. I mean, yes, yeah, too much stress. You know, for the mother. So this is what he was talking about with that. Well, my mom at the time, my mom was, let's see, this would have been 98 that that all kind of came out. Um, So my mom was, I don't know, almost 60 years old. And my dad had, my dad passed away in 94. Mm -hmm. And my mom was one of those very religious, very Catholic, very saintly women who her entire life was devoted to my dad. So she never truly got over the death of my dad until years later. So when this all happened, the death of my dad was still an issue for my mom. And then now all of a sudden she is hearing like your son killed somebody. Yeah. And we think, we think you know about it. And, you know, they, and they were, mm. I really mixed emotions about the police because, they were relentless going after my mom. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, I think, well, they were doing their job. They're trying yeah. to solve this case. But it was my mom, so I was like, hey, back off. <laughs> mm. So initially, I kind of just stayed out of everything. I, I was At the time, I was still living with my mom, you know, helping her out. Uh, my, my mom barely ever worked before my dad passed away. She didn't drive before my dad passed away, so... Oh. At 56 years old, my mother got a driver's license for the first time. Wow. Oh, wow. So I stayed home. I, li- I was living with my mom and helping her out and just kind of, you know, just kind of making sure she was getting through daily life. Pretty cool. Yeah. 
I just got my driver's license. You guys remember that? Yep. I was 32. Basically, I let my license expire, and I had to get my driver's license again. So the brothers wearing a wire obviously didn't work, okay? The police are now pressuring the mother mm. because they need to get something. They need. I mean, this is a case that is needs to be solved. It needs to be closed. The books need to be closed. The killer needs to be in prison. They all need to go home. Now the police come up and ask Chuck to wear a wire. Oh. Oh. Yeah. But now he doesn't. But the reason he doesn't is because, just like before, just like his other two brothers... It'd be too weird. Not, yeah, well, too weird. I mean, he'll know. Yeah. I mean, the guy, you know, Ed, Ed he's, he, like he Chuck said, I mean, he's a right smart guy. Him. Yeah, see right through it. I'll even show you an article from a newspaper that corroborates what I'm about to say. The reason Chuck decided to do this was to protect his mother. So now his mindset is not, should I or shouldn't I, because he's my brother. It's now, I got to protect my mother. Mm-hmm. When I said, no, you're not doing that. Like, I'm, I can't allow that to happen to my mom. Not right now. She's not in the right place for that to happen. They said, well, 10 minutes ago, you said that you were the only one he would talk to. And I was like, I did say that, didn't I? And they were like, so if you don't want your mom subpoenaed, you can meet us at the courthouse right now. And we'll talk to you about everything. Mm. So I was like. Wow. Okay, I'm on my way. Because I had to protect my mom. Yeah. Wow. So I left work. I went down to the county courthouse, which was across the street from the county jail. Um, they sat me down. They they put me in. They put me in this room. It was almost like a closet, and they put they sat me down on a box. And then there were like probably like four or five. Detectives came in. They were pretty large men. I just remember yeah. thinking, oh, my God, they are enormous. But they sat me down on a box that was very low to the ground. And then oh, wow. they all came in. They all came in and they stood up to make me oh. look even more powerful. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of like intimidation. And they basically said, OK, we need you to go talk to your brother. We need you to talk to him about this case. And if you don't, we're going to subpoena your mom. Like they just kept throwing that at me. So Mm. once I agreed, then they started, okay, well, we need you to wear a wire. We need you to do this. And I was like, so I'm not wearing a wire. That's where I, that's where I draw the line. If you want me to gain a level of trust between me and him, then I can't have a wire on because it will be all over my face that I'm, I'm wearing a wire. If you want me to go have a conversation with him and relay the information to you, I will do that. I cannot wear a wire. Mm. So after after probably 30 minutes of me saying no, they finally were like, okay, that's fine. You don't have to wear wire. Wow. Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. But you see, I mean, he's like his mission in life right now is to protect his mother. Yeah. Very noble. Absolutely. You know? So like the whole time that you're listening to this, our fans out there, don't just be listening to what he says and what I say. Like try to think about your own family member. Put yourself in the shoes. Would you testify... Or would you go to your own brother and try to get him to confess or sister? What would you do if your mother was going through all this? Would you try to protect her? Like, put yourself in his shoes. So he started, like, he got up on the table at one point and was, like, checking the corners of the room. Just, oh, like, wow. looking for looking for a microphone. Like, he, yeah. I think that was the moment that he knew, like, they've got you. He doesn't confess to Chuck. But what Chuck does do as i was talking about earlier you know he's very smart compassionate guy he actually convinces his brother to go forward and tell the the truth to the police oh good that's good yeah wow and that was him that was chuck that did that so wow that's amazing so this is an article right here someone wants to read this this is from seacoast online posted september 24th 1999 i'm putting all these links uh, for my sources on talkmer.com, just like always. The uh, title is Brother, Inmate, Take Stand in Murder Trial. The confession was given to police after Piawek's brother, Chuck, convinced him to talk with police. The testimony of Chuck Piawek was very emotional. I asked him to help tell the police what he knew about Carol Caswell, said Chuck Piawek. I wanted him to say that he had nothing to do with it. I didn't want it to be true. 
Chuck Piawak spoke softly, cautiously. Often he paused to drink water and to or to wipe his brow. Tears often filled his eyes, showing a man who loved his brother and had struggled to do the right thing. Chuck Piawak said he worked with the police to protect his mother, Audrey. He said he and his brother, Ed, shared a very close bond with his mother. It was a bond that finally let Ed agree to speak with the police to save his mother pain. Wow. All right, let me get back to Chuck. He goes in there, and he's nervous as hell, obviously. The police actually gave him a few talking points. He was told to say these three things and see what his brother would, how his brother would react to him. Interesting. They gave me three pieces of information that I didn't know what they even meant. So after I agreed to go in and talk, they said, what's your biggest concern? And I said, my biggest concern is that my brother is very, very smart. And he's going to know what's going on. And he's not going to talk to me. And they said, okay, how much information do you think you can get out of your brother? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I haven't talked to him in months. He's been in jail. Like, I don't know. So they said, okay, talk to him as much as you can. Get as much as you can out of him. If the conversation comes to a standstill, tell him these three things. And they said, tell him we know who Mickey Tompkins is. Tell him that we have the Chevy Nova. And tell him that we know what was in the trunk. Wow. Wow. I went over to the jail. It was not visiting hours. It was not a time that anybody can go talk to a prisoner. Like, I was the only person walking into this jail. And they go get my brother, and they put us in, like, an attorney room. So it was soundproof, and it was just me and him talking. And, you know, so right away, he says, what are you even doing here? I don't have visiting hours right now. And I said, so I said, I'm going to be completely honest with you, and I'm going to tell you exactly what's happening. The police are across the street. (laughs) I'm here because they sent me. I'm here because if I don't sit here, they're going to make mom testify against or in front of a grand jury. Mm -hmm. And I got sent over here to talk to you about Carol Caswell. So initially he was like, I don't know who that is. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, he kind of just was was blowing me off. Yeah. And so I, you know, he he kept saying, I don't know who that is. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And I kept saying, do you know anything about, you know, what do you know about this case? Like this woman was murdered. What do you know? And he just kept saying like, oh, I think I've heard her name before, you know, whatever. And I kept saying like, well, did you have anything to do with it? And he wouldn't answer me. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I remember I started crying and he was like, what's the matter? And I was like, I want you to be standing on this table screaming. I didn't do this. And you're not like, you're just very nonchalant. Like you're not answering me. You're not saying, no, I didn't do it. Hmm. You're not saying, yes, you did it. But you're not like defending yourself at all. You're not saying anything. Yeah. Yeah. And he was like, well, I don't know what you want me to do and, you know, whatever. So we got to a point in the conversation, probably about an hour in, where finally I said to him, well, this conversation isn't really going anywhere. So can I ask you a question? And he was like, sure. And I said, who's Mickey Tompkins? And his eyes got wide and he kind of looked at me and he was like, I don't know. Hmm, interesting. I said, okay. I said, so what? Did Mickey Tompkins drive a Chevy Nova or did you? And his eyes got a little wider. And then I said, and what was in the trunk, Ed? What was in the trunk of the, of the Chevy Nova? What was in the trunk? Hmm. Wow. He, I mean, that's a pretty powerful. I know he yeah. was yeah. nervous, but he really did a masterful job yeah. knowing he, uh, obvi- he knows his brother's personality and then he knows he'll know instantly if he's lying to him. Yep. Yeah. So we came out with the truth. He was sent there by the police, you know, let him have it, almost, you know, in yeah. a sense. And damn. Good job, Chuck. What was damn. in the trunk, Ed? That's pretty powerful. Just Very that powerful. sentence. What was in the trunk? This is a shocker. This is going to shock you guys. Carol Caswell wasn't actually the only person that was murdered in this story we're talking about. Really? And... Ed being the prime suspect, is what I'm trying to say. Oh, dear. Now, Ed has never been charged with this murder in particular. Okay. This is from Seacoast Online, posted April 12, 2010. 
The title is Waiting for Justice in Dover. Sheila Holmes' family wants arrest made in 1990. Wow. Killing. 1990. Okay. Mm. When did uh, Carol Caswell die? 96. 96. 96. If you want to read this, go ahead. It's been over 20 years since Sheila J. Holmes was murdered and her family is still waiting for someone to be held responsible. It just never entered my mind that it would come to this point, said Cindy Allard, Holmes' sister, 20 years later and still no arrest. Holmes' beaten and strangled body was discovered April 13, 1990 at the railroad tracks on Forest Street in Dover. She was 31 years old and a mother of five. Yeah. The man that the authorities have named as the only suspect in Holmes' slang is already serving life in prison for the murder. Edward Piawick of Summersworth was convicted in the 1996 drowning and beating death of Carol Caswell of Portsmouth. Piawick was never charged with the killing of Holmes, and our case is now one of the cases being reviewed by the state's new cold case unit. In 2002, former Attorney General Kelly Ayat told Fosters that Piawix was still the focus of their investigation into Holmes's killing. Now, this wow. was posted in 2010. One That's of the, almost 10 more years ago. Yeah. So what I'm really seeing is one of the reasons they're not really pushing this case too much is because the possible killer, most likely, from what they're saying, I'm not saying he did or didn't. And in fact, Chuck doesn't even know. We'll get to that. Is already in prison for life. Without parole. So, yeah, it's great to bring a resolution to the family. Now they know, you know, but at the end of the day, what's it going to change? The guy is not getting out of prison anyway. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. You give him another life sentence. He's not going to live more than once. Well, he still deserves it. Well, yeah, but it's not going to change his outcome at well, all. Well, I think it's just a matter of. Yeah, did he re- did yeah. he No, but did he really do it or is there another killer out there on the loose? The police have targeted Piawick because he is the most likely suspect. I asked Chuck what he thought about it. Did your brother kill Sheila Holmes? Did your brother kill more than one person? Chuck, tell me. Tell me these things, Chuck. You know, like the Sheila Holmes case, they really have no evidence. Um, Here's the evidence that they have against my brother. My brother knew her. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, apparently there were tire tracks at the location that she was found that were, that could have been possible tire, could have been a match to possible tires that he could have had on his possible vehicle at the time. Mm. And there was, um, there was a cool menthol cigarette, which is what my brother smoked. Mm Mm-hmm. Jen, you smoke cool. As far as I know, that's the only evidence that they've had. Yeah, against him, which is why I think they can't pursue anything. But I think they're a hundred percent convinced that it was him. Yeah. Does he think that it was him? Well, he says later, as you'll hear, that some days he does, some days he doesn't. Mm. That's another thing about this, and we're going to get into like the what he has to deal with. I'm but I mean, sh- you know, he thinks him. about this every day. Oh, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this has definitely changed his life. Right. I tell. 100%. You got Sheila Holmes. This was 1990, before Carol Caswell. Now mm-hmm. you have another one. The headline on this one is, Police Ask for Help to Solve Cold Case. This was posted from Fosters.com, January 12th, 2016. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, Ed Piawick is the main suspect of this. Her name is Lisa Snyder. That's her picture right there. If you want to read this. Police are asking for the public's help in solving a 30-year-old Rollinsford murder case. Lisa Snyder of Bow was 20 when she was reported missing July 4th, 1985, while visiting her sister in Dover. Her decomposed body was found off Rollins Road in Rollinsford on April 18th, 1987. The medical examiner concluded that Snyder had been strangled to death. Rollinsford Police Chief Bob Ducarm was said nothing new had developed in the case, but police are hoping that information since the 30 year anniversary of the crime is coming up. We're just trying to spark some interest and get it out there. Ducarme said it hasn't been in the public for quite some time. Hopefully there's still someone who remembers seeing who remembers something or has some information that can get this crime solved and get some closure for the family. 
Ducarme said Snyder's death is only is the only ho- homicide in Rollinsford in his tenure with the department, which dates back to 1980. Ducarme was the responding officer in 1987 when a man reported fa- finding Snyder's partially clothed skeletal, skeletal remains after he stopped to look at some old farm equipment near a collapsed rock foundation off Rollins Road. The area is known as Old Dodge Farm. Yeah, so this is 1985. Seven. Oh, yeah. Five. Mm-hmm. So this is 1985. This is before 1990 and obviously before 1996. That would make him, if Ed Piawick did this, the Carol Caswell was like the last murderer. Okay, these two other were before. Yeah. You know, that, mm-hmm. would, that would put three on his list. Okay. But like, you know, like what I've seen in a lot of the news is, well, he's already in prison, which is true. He's already in life, life in prison. You know what I'm saying? I know mm-hmm. it's good to bring justice, but then again, like, they, I guess they weigh some kind of cost versus uh, benefit. And they can't get Gallup to confess or whatever. to this. No, he he's not going to f- confess to this. This is what Chuck says. You would think that they could just to get the closure because it's no impact to him, you know, but. So I asked Chuck. Chuck, 1985, Chuck, like, how old was your brother then? Like, did, do you think that he killed Lisa Snyder? I just struggle with the answer because I, yeah. like, t- today I would say yes, and then next week I'll be like, I don't know. I don't know if he did that one. You know, like, he would have been 19 years old at the time, I think. Um, he was a newlywed. He, was, he had a new baby in December of 85. He had, um, he had his first child. I don't know, yeah. you know, but then, but then I start thinking, well, that was before he ever went to rehab. The Dodge Farm, which is where they found Lisa Snyder's body years yeah. later, um, was his hangout. Hmm. His, his, his generation hung out at this, cause it was kind of like an obscure place hmm. in this tiny little town that was next to our hometown. Yeah. Um, you know, that I don't I don't even think that town at the time had a police force. Oh, really? um, so oh, it was kind of like a you know, yeah, you know, it was kind of like a free place to just go hang out and party and drink and, you know, get high or whatever. So my, I go back and forth. Like sometimes, you know, when I'm when I'm really introspective, I, I, I think, you know, maybe. And then sometimes I think, no, no, he wasn't killing people for 15 years. I have to think, yeah. I have to think that I think for my own, you know, my own sanity, maybe. Was that serial killer that we talked about that every time, like, he would have a family stressor, like, he'd have a new baby, he'd go kill people? Oh, well, yeah. Which, was that, wasn't that, um... Yeah, Golden State Killer. No, that's when he stopped killing, oh. right? Uh, I can't remember. It's been so many. All right, this is from the same article. Um, this is our only unsolved murder. According to an online obituary, Snyder was born September 10th, 1964 in Franklin. The main suspect in the case, Edward B. Piawick of Summersworth, was convicted in 1999 for the 1996 murder of Carol Caswell. Piawick was never charged with Snyder's death and is currently serving a life sentence for Caswell's murder at the facility in Oregon. So there may even be a fourth victim. This is what Chuck says about that. There was a fourth one when we were going through... When we were going through the, uh, when the police were like contacting us and before the trial and before he was arrested and all that, he lived in Colleen, Texas for a while because huh. he was in the army. Yeah. And apparently a prostitute was murdered at the time that he lived there. Hmm. So like the police from there came, when he was, when he was named as the suspect in the Caswell case, the police from Colleen came up and they were like working with the New Hampshire police, like trying to figure out if he was involved in that. Oh, wow. They ultimately decided that he was not. Yeah. I also think they, I think they figured out that he actually wasn't there at the time. Yeah. But they were pretty convinced that he was part of that also. But Jeez. that one did not pan out, obviously. So going back to the first murder, Caswell, one of the defense strategies for that one from Ed's defense team was comparing the size differences between Ed and Mickey. Mickey was tall. He was over six feet. Mm-hmm. Ed's not. He's five foot six, I think, oh. is what uh, Chuck said. So. And that was his defense the whole time. His defense was, yeah, I wasn't alone. 
Yeah. And at one point, so Mickey, so my brother, my brother's a very small guy. He's, um, I, I want to say he's like five, two or five, three. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. real tiny little guy. And Mickey Tompkins was not, he was well wow. over six feet, probably wow. 225 pounds. He was a big guy. Yeah. And I, I heard that at one point while Mickey was testifying that they actually made him stand up in front of the judge and they put my brother and him back to back. Huh. And they were like, so you think this guy convinced this guy to kill somebody? Like, <laughs> come on now. Yeah. You know, that was, that was one of the, one of their defense tactics because the guy, you know, Mickey Tompkins was so much bigger. The attorney, when he was talking to Chuck, because Chuck had to testify against his own brother. I can't imagine doing that. Going into a courtroom, Mm-mm. you know, because you're on the stand in the, what do they call it, the pulpit? The bullpit? The bench? No, the bullpit. The pul- The pul- bullpen? The bullpen? Bullpen. No, the thing that... Pulpit? Pulpit. The or is bench. that something else? It's like in church. Oh. Yeah, they're at the bench. No, not the bench. Like up there on the stand. Stand. Oh, they're in the stand. stand. Yeah. So he's up there in the stand. And now he's looking down and his brother is sitting there. You know, and I would just be like, shit, I am not making eye contact with that motherfucker. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, it's got to be like the worst feeling. So anyway, the attorney, what they do is they coach them before. Yeah. I mean, they like practice. I'm talking about for hours. Chuck would, Chuck had to go through hours and hours and hours of being coached here. I mean, that's just normal practice, mm-hmm. though. I mean, you said you didn't look at your brother. I don't think I would either, to be honest. I yeah, I mean, there were a couple times that, you know, we made eye contact kind of by mistake. And he was yeah. he was actually being very supportive. Like, he was smiling at me. And, you know, he was he was trying to say, like, it's okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, oh, you know, another hard. one more thing I want to add, because mm-hmm. we had my so actually two more things. The prosecutor was a lady named Kelly Ayotte. Kelly Ayotte actually ended up becoming a U.S. senator from New Hampshire. Mm, I, oh, okay. I recognize um, so that. I always thought that was pretty cool. Like. Hey, I know her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, because uh, I spent a lot of time with her, because they interviewed me probably 15 times for probably five hours each time. Oh, and it was Lord. the same wow. questions yeah. over and over and over. Like, they just wanted to make sure they knew what I was going to say in the courtroom. So we had a break in between the prosecutor asking me questions, like when they said, okay, you know, that's all I have. And then my brother's attorney was going to ask questions. We had a break, so everybody was out in the hallway of the courthouse, and we were all just kind of, you know, mingling around, just waiting. And my brother's attorney approached me, and she's like, hey, Chuck, can we talk for a minute? And I was like, yeah, sure. So he had two attorneys, David Rothstein, and then they brought in this woman named Barbara. I don't remember her last name. Kushner, maybe, or Ketchner. So she brought me into this room, and she said, so after we have this break, you're going to be questioned by either me or David Rothstein. And I was like, okay. And she said, so I'm going to ask you one question. And the answer to that question will will determine, one, it'll determine who's going to question you. And two, it'll determine how long we're going to question you. Mm. So I was like, okay. And she said, if I said to you, do you think your brother did this? Mm. What would be your answer? Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, and I said, my answer would be, yes, I do. And she goes, okay, so if you had said no, I would have questioned you, and that would have been the only question that we ask. But instead, David's going to question you, and I can't tell you how long he's going to question you. It might be 10 minutes. It might be five hours. And I go, are you asking me to lie? (sighs) Wow. Uh, do you want me to lie? Is that what you're asking me to do? Because I, I feel like there's some type of attorney rule that you're not oh, supposed yeah. to be doing what you're doing. It, it does kind of sound like that now that. Wow. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because what they wanted to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she wanted oh, wow. me to say no. She wanted me to say no. So that, that would be it. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Hmm. But she started to walk away because she said it really nasty. She was like, either I'm going to question you or he's going to question you. And if he questions you because that's how you answer, I don't know how long you're going to be up there. And she turned around and started walking away. And I said, hold on a minute. And she turned around. And I go, are you asking me to lie? Good I for you like for saying you're not that. Yeah, honestly. That. And she just yeah. turned around and walked up. She just turned around and walked out of the room. Damn, that's fucked up. 
That's really fucked up. I, I, there's got to be like, yeah, it's, something against that. Well, I don't know. I mean, they trying to win. I don't know, man. It's, yeah, yeah but, but it kind of like undermines the whole purpose yeah. of having a witness and going to court. Yeah, like yeah. you shouldn't be able to ask that in advance. I feel like that's like tampering with the witness or something. I don't mm-hmm. know. All right, so just picture yourself one more time. Your sister, your brother, you're sitting there. You got to testify against them. That's got to be the hardest thing ever. I asked Chuck. I was like, how did that? I mean, you must have been freaking out. That must have been one of the most difficult things you've ever had to do. And this is what he said. I can only imagine going into that courtroom my brother sitting there. I mean, uh, then again, my, me and my brother are only two years apart. I know that probably makes a huge difference. Yeah, you know, I think that played a role in it. Ultimately, what it came down to the entire time was I'm doing this so that my mother doesn't have to. Yes. And that's everything that I did, yeah. everything that I did the entire time, whether it was talk to the police, whether it was go into the jail, testify, wear a wire, not wear a wire, every single thing was so that my mom didn't have to. And I don't even know that they ever would have made my mother do that. That was their threat to me. Hmm. Who knows if they ever actually would have followed through with that. But when they mm-hmm. said that to me, they knew how close I was to my mom. Yeah. So when they said that to me, they knew that they had me emotionally so that I would do whatever they wanted me to do. Mm. Well, he was, he was protecting her. It was like a, you know, fight or yeah. flight type mm-hmm. response. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so his brother, Ed Piawick, life without parole. I mean, because picture your own sister, your own brother. Life without parole. They take him away, handcuffs on, walk him out like a caged animal, pretty much. I mean, that's how it is. I was like, Chuck, were you shocked by the verdict? And this is what he said. I was not shocked with the verdict. I mean, the um, the evidence was pretty compelling. The evidence that I have heard about uh, was pretty compelling. And I had all the experiences with him at the jail when I talked to him those several times. Yeah, and he he never said I did it. He never ever confessed to me. He never said I did it. He never said I was involved. He never said anything like that. Some something, some light of this kind of story. Yeah, some maybe change the mood a little bit. Mm-hmm. Chuck did said he had a really funny story when he was testifying. I hope he doesn't mind me playing this. Oh, it's pretty funny. It reminds me of you, Jen. I think you. This would happen to you. Not in a bad way, but... I got you. So I was terrified to testify, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't grow up in a family for money. I didn't have a lot of stuff. So when I had to testify, I was like, oh, damn, I need to go buy some new clothes. <laughs> I want to look presentable in court. <laughs> so although I didn't buy a suit, I went out and bought, you know, I bought a new shirt and new pants yeah. and new shoes. You know, I, I was trying to just get through it. But I bought these shoes that had, you know, the little loop that they put on the back of your heel so that you can like, yeah, pull yeah. the shoe mm-hmm. onto yeah. it. So the, sh- the shoes had that on it. Well, while I'm testifying, I crossed my legs, like, you know, behind the, I was in the little box or whatever. So I crossed my legs. The bullpen. You know, I was trying to concentrate <laughs> on what was happening. And um, I tried to uncross my legs and I couldn't. What? Oh, yeah, I this would stuck. totally happen to me. So... <laughs> My, oh no! They got caught. Yes, they got stuck, can, yes, they got stuck on the shoelace of an other shoe. Oh no! So literally, my feet were stuck together while I'm testifying. So I had a friend there with me who was sitting in the in the gallery part of the courtroom, and yeah. I had you know I, I I asked her I was like just sit there and just allow me to stare at you because I don't want to look at my brother, I don't want to oh, look yeah. at I don't want to look at who's talking to me. Like I just need something to focus on. So I had a friend in the in the gallery and apparently my face apparently I went like white as a ghost and I just had like this look of terror on my face yeah (laughs) and she was like looking at me like what the hell's going on like I I remember her putting her hands up like you know kind of like what what and um so I looked down I had to like push the chair back a little bit and I looked down and I was like oh okay I can fix that no problem (laughs) it's just my shoelace okay good like I was like oh my god am I paralyzed like what the hell's going on so I like I like started timing it in my head. I was like, okay, I need to bend down and I need to unhook the lace. Okay, all right. So after the next question, I'll do it. 
That must so have been, I bent down maybe that was a to good go distraction, then. unhook yeah. the, the lace from my shoe, and I hit my forehead on oh, the microphone. No. Oh, oh, no. Oh, yeah, no. So I hit my forehead this on the would microphone. Happen to it me. made, like, the loudest noise ever, oh. and then the microphone went swinging out. Oh, like, God. Like, like, <laughs> did, like, a 360 and came all the way back to me. Oh, and I was no. like, I was so humiliated. Jeez. Oh, my God. They actually called They actually called the recess. The judge was like, are you, are you okay? And I was like, I'm fine. And he's like, why don't we take a recess? And I was like, oh, my oh, God. And, so, and then I had a red dot on my forehead. Oh, like, oh my God. God. <laughs> it was awful. It was so yeah. awful. Aww. Yeah, Aww. that's funny. I can just imagine, man, like you hit that with your forehead and the thing swings around and hits you again. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, geez. Sounds like when you hit me in the face with the... Yeah, with this thing. It's yeah. exactly the same. I don't hit you in the face with that, Jen. Well, not that anyone knows. You fell down the stairs, okay? <laughs> to which we have no stairs. <laughs> All right. So, this case obviously weighs on Chuck, I can tell. And I mean, it would weigh on anyone. Of course. And like I said, mm-hmm. like going into this, like you may think, oh, well, his brother's like that. He must be like that. Now, you guys. No way. He's definitely not like that. Yeah. You guys can really see yeah. how compassionate this guy is. It makes you different, nonetheless. Mm-hmm. It's. Yeah. When anyone asks, oh, how many siblings do you have at a barbecue? I can imagine just that alone is an awkward topic of conversation. Oh, yeah. I asked Chuck, you know, Chuck, how has this affected you personally? How it affected me after I, you know, I withdrew from my, from all of my friends. I stopped talking to everybody in my world because, you know, again, I know I keep saying this, but small town New Hampshire, like I had people... I graduated from high school in 93. I had people reaching out to me in 99 that I hadn't seen literally since Hmm. my high school graduation. And they would be like, hey, Chuck, how are you doing? So what the hell is going on with your brother? Uh, That's so rude. Yeah. It was was constant, you know. That's before social media. I went into a uh, a convenience store Mm -hmm. one one day. I don't don't even remember what I was purchasing, but I used my my debit card to pay. Oh, wow, yeah. You know, and, and the cashier was, you know, she took my card and then she swiped it and then she was waiting for it. And she was like, oh, my God. Are you oh related to Ed? No. Oh, jeez. You know, and, and, and then with the with with the press people, you know, calling yeah. my work saying, hey, I got this press release about Oreo cookies. Are you Ed's brother? That's awful. <clears throat> yeah. And so you're, your name is not was a, common either. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a name like Smith, you know. <laughs> right. But, yeah. Jesus. So, um, so. Yeah. I, I mean, th- to think that was an age before Facebook, before Instagram, and he's still kind of getting that. Yeah. I mean, that must be. Now he'd be tagged and stuff. Oh, God. I mean, the, the number. Social media. The number of Facebook messages that I could imagine him getting today. I mean, maybe he yeah. still does in yeah, today's maybe. age. I mean, but, I would, like I told him, I was like. God, that's awful. Your name. I mean, have you ever heard of anyone by the nope. name of Piawick? I mean, maybe that's a New Hampshire name. I don't know, but I've, this is the first one I've ever heard of that name. So, you know, we talked a little bit about the mental health and stuff because they go through it, too. He was also talking about, you know, he wanted support and there was just none out there. So this may be something for mm-hmm. someone to think about. Um, the families are also victims. Oh, absolutely. Right. So, and not even, I mean, yes, the family of the murder victim, obviously, number one, but also the family like Chuck, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, think about, I mean, we talk, we talk a lot about victims and how, you know, how awful it is to lose a loved one. And this is a different kind of losing of the loved one. But think about, you know, Ellie, when, when you're the victim or family of a victim, you tend to talk about that person in like such elevated terms like oh they're such wonderful people I'm so sorry this happened versus in Chuck's case in his family's case people aren't saying nice things about your family member they're probably saying things like oh that's awful your brother's such a monster you know I can imagine that those are the types of things that you get comments about right you know granted I get it he's this is a killer versus a victim but there's just different sensitivity to the family that they're still going through a hard time. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things that, and I had mentioned this in my initial, um, you know, my initial email to you was one of the things I've become passionate about is that family members of the perpetrators 
are also victims. Mm, yeah. And there's no resources for someone like me. Yeah. I remember at one point we asked the prosecution and we asked like the police, we were like, is there somebody that my mom can talk to? Is there somebody that will talk to me? Like, I'm really struggling with this. I have to, you know, I have to testify against my brother next week and it's a murder trial. And I grew up in small town, New Hampshire, you know, I, yeah. I don't know the last time there's been a murder in my hometown, you know, and basically they said, well, we can, we can have you talk to the victim's advocate, but just remember She's assigned to Carol's family, not yours, but we can certainly have her come and talk to you. Mm. And we were like, mm. no, <laughs> no, like that's their resource. Yeah. It's like I will figure it out on our own, I uh -huh. guess, you know. What's up? And that's unfortunate because, you know, my family went through hell. Yeah. And they, we did not go through the hell that the Carol Caswell family went through. I don't ever want to get that confused. Yeah. You know, there's there's never been a day that I've ever thought of them, you know, with any type of resent because they had help. Like, that's not at all what I'm trying to say. But I think the forgotten victims in crimes are the families of the perpetrators. Hmm. Well said. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is very well said. And, you know, I never thought about that before. I'm going to be honest. Never thought about it. Yeah. But, you know, it's true. Different perspective. Yeah, definitely opened up a new perspective to me. So at the end of the interview, and I was, we we're talking about how, you know, time can change people's, you know, maybe his brother feels remorse or, or whatever. Mm. So I asked him, you know, how's your brother doing now? And I was being sincere. I, I really wanted to know, like, is, is he, I know he's imprisoned. Does he got a, a routine? Is he, you know, because, you know, like Edmund Kemper is like recording audio audiobooks books and stuff. Like, yeah. you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, is he, is he making purpose in his life? And this is what Ed told me. So part of my personal experience and part of my healing and getting past it is that I have chosen to not continue a relationship with him. Okay. I don't blame him. Um, so my mom still does. My mom talks to him. You know, she has that motherly instinct where, you know, she still needs to know that he's okay. Mm -hmm. I've seen him a couple, I've, I no, I've only seen him one time because my mom one time did like a video chat with him. Yeah. The, the jail offered some type of like almost like a Skype type thing. Mm -hmm. And I sat down that day and I talked to him um, for maybe about two minutes. But it was very like, you know, he was very, oh my God, I'm so happy to see you. You're doing so well, you know, that kind of a, and again, he just, he plays on your emotions. So my mom has been telling him for years that I was struggling with this whole situation and that, you know, that I was, that I had hard, had a hard time with it. Yeah. Um, I can so imagine. Saw me, I mean, I'm sure it's not easy because, I mean, another thing is you don't know, like you just said, like you don't know. And that's yeah. probably, it probably drives you up the wall. It probably drives you crazy, you know? It does. I mean, as far as not knowing, so this is, as far as the Carol Caswell case, I, I do believe that, I do believe that he did it. Mm -hmm. um, I do, what I don't know about that case is I don't know if the other guy was involved yeah. and that he was the lucky one that the police found first. Yeah. It's mm. a good point. It could have been the other way around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you think there would be a point later down the road when you guys, you know, are more close, I guess? I mean, the only answer I can give is I don't know right now. There's yeah. been times. I mean, it's been, you know, it's been almost 20 years since he's been convicted. Yeah. And so there's been spans of time that I say to myself, I'm going to sit down and write him a letter. Like, you know, it's been 15 years. It's time to move on. It's time for him to know that I still love him. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, I, I, I don't like what you did. And you're, you are exactly where you should be if you did this. But that I'm, I still love you. Yeah. Um, but I've never done it. I mean, I know it's, a yeah. it's tough. Like, I can't sit here and say that I relate to you in any way because I mean, of what you had to go through. But we're we're here for you if that means anything. <laughs> you can, you know, I don't probably It does. Mean I anything, mean, I, <laughs> I wrote in my, I wrote in one of my emails, like, or, or on my post, like, I've listened to several different true crime po podcasts yeah. and I just can't. I can't get attached to any of them. And then once I heard you guys, I was like, this shit is real. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, 
I, I mean, I can kind of understand a totally different scenario, but I can understand, like, it, it's, you have to think about when you make the deliberate choice to not have somebody in your life like that because of something that they did in general or to you, it, like, you want to move on and it probably feels just as healthy to you to not write that letter than it is to just let it go mm-hmm. yeah. and and know you know what they're they've lived their life and you've got to live yours i mm-hmm. I, Good I get point. that yeah i'd probably do the same it's just because then i mean like i said a totally different situation but i can empathize with thinking about that letter and then you have to think well what's going to come back from that am i yeah. op- am i opening up a relationship with you know this person am i inviting them is that going to cause additional anxiety into my life what what does that mean and if like it's for mental health purposes i get it it's sometimes yeah, better to let it go maybe it'd be different if if his brother or like you said if if it's your brother or whatever like they wrote first and said True. okay you know i'm sorry i love you like, I want to continue a relationship, but I feel like he's not getting anything from right. his brother either, you know? So, I don't know. It's tough, man. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, for this episode, try to put yourself in his shoes. Absolutely. Because, but, yeah. So, that's that's the case. The um, Our talk is Primo Chuck. Ah, yeah, yeah. He Thank you me. for sharing, Chuck. It was it was really a, uh interesting perspective to hear from yeah, I never did that before. I never, um, I didn't know how to really approach the interview because I know it's such a sensitive subject. You know, we we have a true crime comedy. You know what I'm saying? But I'm, I think the interview went well, and I'm glad to be able to do this for you, Chuck. And you yeah, know, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks for your support, Chuck. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks it. so much, Chuck. Seriously. All right, guys, if you really enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit that subscribe button on whatever podcasting app you use. If you already liked this episode, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you're absolutely obsessed with this podcast and want to become our stalker, go to talkmore.com slash join. Become a talk host primo. Get a badass t-shirt, sticker, swag, a lot of love. Shout it out all over the place. Tell me what story you may do. I'll research it. Dedicate it to you on the Talk More To Me podcast. My name is John here with Jen and Nicole. And until next time, good night, y'all. Everybody wants to talk about your penis, my penis, my yes, penis. I do. No, I'm the only one that has like mild interest in it, but otherwise, it's just you. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> she has vested interest in my mild. penis. I said mild. <laughs> <laughs> this penis is gonna make you rich. No, <laughs> I don't think so, unless you're doing something else on the side.